order at 6.33. Thank you all for coming tonight, those here and those on the screen, and we'll get started right now. Um, first item is, are there any amendments to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, uh, we will move into public comment. So public comment is an opportunity for anyone to speak now. You have another opportunity at the end of the meeting. Um, if you're online and you don't have your name on your um, on the Zoom, would you please um, identify yourself before speaking? Uh, we have one request from Nisha McNabb. Hi, my name is Misha McNabb. I just wanted to introduce myself briefly. Um, and uh, I am the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Specialist from the Dep Vermont Department of Health. I understand that y'all are may have some requests from uh, the Department of Education, Agency of Education for Stop the Bleed, Narcan training, and Be Bright at Night training. And I wanted to, I am your point of contact for that training when you decide to schedule it. All right, well, thank you very much, Nisha. I'm sure that when that time comes, somebody will be in touch on that. Is there anything yeah. else you wanted to say? No, I'll drop my contact information for the Vermont Department of Health in the chat so y'all can have it in the meeting minutes and notes whenever it is requested. I think the chat is disabled, so um, you're if right, you could just is. snip to, to Terry, Terry's and stuff, uh, that would be great. I'm sorry. I if you could send well, it to Superintendent Sherry Sousa. Sherry Sousa? Got yes. it. Yes. We'll do. Yeah, I, bet, I bet Lara can also offer it to us, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on from the audience here or online? Okay. Then we will move into the next um, order of business, which is the reports. Uh, Sherry could not be with us tonight due to a family medical situation, so we have her report in writing. If there are any comments on that, I'm happy to hear from the board. She just said really nice things about me. I wanted to point that out. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> oh, I thought you were just joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, she did have some some great things to say. Um, then uh, the next report would be from the Director of Technology and Innovation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, two quick updates um, on our technology work. I uh, just wanted to share with you um, an exciting development. Uh, we formed a work group um, to focus and, and talk about um, artificial intelligence. Um, so this was prompted by some educators who've been doing some professional development around AI and really wanted an opportunity to talk about what they were learning and for us to begin to think about what it means for us as we're doing our work. Um, so this group is newly formed, we've been going that once, um, but we'll be meeting monthly for the remainder of the school year um, as we begin to think about these issues and how they impact our students. Um, and the other piece is just to mention that um, all of you should have gotten an email from me mentioning um, the two-factor authentication uh, requirements will be going into effect for all of our users uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you need help, please let me know. I'm happy to um, walk you through the process or, or get you a security key for that process. Can you tell us when you need to get that computer design? I believe that's... The 28th is what I said. Yeah. 28th or Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rap. Um, from the Director of Student Support Services. I'm sorry, she's unwell. She couldn't be here. Okay. Very good. Uh, curriculum instruction and assessment. 
Good evening, everyone. Jen Staten, CIA. Uh, I have a few updates for you. <laughs> Um, first, I wanted to mention that we are in the midst of our literacy training as we aim for these proficiency goals that we have in literacy. And right now, Julie Brown is working with teachers in grades 5 through 12. And we are lucky to have you here tonight. And she's just going to share a piece of information about what's happening with those teachers. Hi, everyone. Julie Brown. So we're working with 30, 35, grades 5 through 12 teachers. They're incredible. We're learning about um, current reading research and some shifts we can make collaboratively in our classrooms to ensure more of our students um, succeed in our classrooms. So it's very exciting. Thanks, Julie. Really. Yeah. Um, we yeah. also had our Late Start Wednesday uh, last week, which um, you probably experienced. And what was great about this one was teachers got to meet with one another from different groups and hear about the learning that's happened. It's called a jigsaw, where they get to share and learn from one another. And that's really important in moving forward our equity work. And then last thing I just wanted to touch base on was um, the results of NEASC are still embargoed, unfortunately, but Darren is here to share a little bit about that process, and we hope to have the results for you next time. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, the results are still in process. I'll get a draft report sometime in the spring and bring it forward to the community to share with it. Um, but a little bit of an update. So the NEASC process, so that's the New England Association of Colleges and, and Schools, uh, does both public and private schools around New England as well as colleges. Uh, so they've updated their process. It used to be a 10-year process of really, and we've been credited to study the 56, every 10 years to do a deep dive into the tool. About 10 years ago, they updated the process to be an ongoing cycle. And so we've been getting toward what was our decennial visit just in November for the past couple of years. Uh, in 2009, we did a deep self-reflection based on all the standards and identified what are some growth areas for us. We hosted a virtual collaborative conference visit in 2021 during that year to look at um, what we presented and see if they confirmed with us that what we said was accurate. And they did agree with us and identified four areas. Um, one was to work on our written curriculum. Another one was to look at how are we doing uh, our assessment of the portrait of a graduate and giving feedback to students and families. Uh, a third was looking at our, our tier one and tier two supports. So how are we doing those in-class support structures for students? And then the last one was to look at some of our uh, infrastructure and building impact in deficiencies and issues happening with families. So we then said, here's what our growth will look like in those areas. We submitted that to the team. Uh, we hosted a large visiting team last month, about eight people. Um, Aiden and Owen gave a tour of the group of the building, probably had 30 plus students in different focus groups. Some board members, thank you, joined a focus group as well to look around those standards. Um, also have met with Joe Rigoli, got into almost every classroom to do a pretty comprehensive review of our high school, middle school. So what we'll get back is both where does our accreditation stand? Um, and then also where these of their standards makes good sense to be focus on our growth. I'll come back in the spring with a report from the commission. Thanks. That's it for me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, the director of finance and operations. Sure. I just have a couple quick things to share. Um, as they noted in my um, in the board book, our kind of payable clerk has left us uh, recently because of all the streamlining we've done in our office. We're going to go without filling the position for a few months and see if we can manage it without the body. Um, my thought is that it's going to be too much and we'll end up putting a part time person in. I don't see that ever returning as a full time position. We streamline so much work that we don't have the need for five days a week, maybe two or three. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, because we've talked a lot about this, but I've never shared the numbers is year to date through December 31st, Rhiannon and all of our team, our teachers, our principals, and everybody else uh, working through our grant writer have raised $326,000 of money above and beyond the budget and still working hard over the next six months to increase that more. But, you know, we don't talk about it much and, you know, everybody, you know, I look back here and I can point half a dozen people here who've been Part of the process of bringing this money in, uh, working with Rhiannon and working with community members, and it's just been great. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Jim. Um, our student representatives. 
Board members, Aiden and Owen. I mean, we stand as we talk, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start with mine. Um, I think that for the past month, um, kind of a little bit of two months too, kind of dip into what we've been doing in November. Uh, it's been filled with a bunch of academic and athletic achievements. Um, which is sports have kicked off to a really strong start. I think that we have like many good amount of games now. There's been a lot of um, wins and home games that really like a lot of students look forward to. I know that I've been to some of the hockey games and really good atmosphere. And um, it's good to see those start up again. Um, the unified basketball team has also begun practicing on Thursdays during like our free period, which we call our time. And um, they're preparing for some games and that they will have late in the coming weeks in March specifically. Um, Yo Theater also had an incredible and engaging and creative performance of Robin Hood, where they, um, many middle and high school students who are part of the theater program, did a lot of dancing and singing and really were like, really got the audience involved. So that was um, really kind of hit for them. Um, the craft program um, has set up an exchange with students in the uh, Bose Bose School, um, and that is located in Ingolstadt, I probably butchered that, Germany. Um, and this game will focus on like kind of just culture and the historical um, food and aggregation systems um, that they have in uh, each, each other's regions. And it'll be cool to see that partnership develop. And um, yeah, a lot of lessons um, are other, making other academic achievements as well. So, and we're going. It really killed me with that report this time. Mine looks really meager, but um, <laughs> I feel like January for students sometimes can be kind of dry. Um, but it's like it's kind of a crunch month. So I know that um, the SAT prep class is kind of starting back up again. And there's a lot of major deadlines because we're on a quarter system, but like our quote unquote semester ends um, in a little bit. Um, and then, you know, kind of on the more lighthearted end, some high school seniors, if they applied early, have heard some exciting news. So I texted Tess way too late, so she didn't come to this meeting, but Tess is uh, going to Tulane in the fall. So congrats to her and there's <laughs> others too. Um, and then, you know, like Aiden was saying, there's some fun kind of community engagement events from student council and your theater and of course, um, winter sports, which continue to have, have a really high level of participation, which is good to see. So yeah, that's it. All right, well, thank you, you too, for all you do. Um, also in our packet is a comprehensive um, report from um, the craft program. So I hope you all have a chance to take a look at the various things that they've been doing. Okay, uh, the next appointment we have is continuous improvement for literacy and mathematics with a presentation. From some of you here. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Why is your front lab work Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Thank you. <laughs> So while we're getting the presentation up, I'll share the context for this today. Um, yeah. Ben, could you please share your screen via screen via Zoom so our Zoom people can see? Sure. So um, this is a presentation of what we're calling our district continuous improvement team. We have some really ambitious goals for student proficiency and literacy and mathematics and to make sure we're reaching those goals and also checking ourselves along the way. We've put together this team to create a process by which we are constantly ensuring we are continuously improving. Um, so the team is made up of the people here, um, sort of had attrition by sickness today, so um, we're all here presenting. Uh, you know me, but would you like to present yourself? Okay. Julie Brown, <clears throat> District Literacy Facilitator. I'm Audrey Richardson. I'm the uh, Secondary MTSS Coordinator. Let me go around. Thank you. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. So um, continuous improvement um, group that we have here is something that we have really been meeting for the last, I would say, like a year, a little over a year. 
um, or through the summer and into this year. Um, but it's a process that started with the literacy um, initiative and math work that we've been doing. Um, and we're really looking at not just what are these different content areas or skills that we're working on in our schools and how can we do it better, but really like how we do it better. So the idea of continuous improvement is based in sort of this improvement science lens. Um, and that really takes us through cycles of improvement. So we're really being intentional about the change that we're trying to make. So the idea with the literacy, the math, and any of those kind of pieces that are involved in this is that we are looking at change over time and sustainable change and building capacity versus like quick, quick fixes. Um, so I think it's very easy to think like, okay, we've decided to really reframe our literacy game. Um, how's that going to happen? And it just happens, right? But we're really, as I said, thinking about intentional change um, that is cyclical and that continues. Um, we've been anchoring some of our work in Anthony Bright's work, which is um, about sort of learning to improve. And the idea, one of the things he says is continuous improvement is just that, continuous. It just keeps going. So this is just kind of an example of a cycle that we would follow. This, you know, we start with the, the local, identifying the local need, um, whether that's, that's based in data. Um, then selecting relevant evidence-based practices, moving to plan for implementation, implementing, and then examining and reflecting. And that's really where we're going to, to focus today is the, the role of assessment in all of this. And then just one other thing that I'll mention is this little diagram kind of shows these cycles of change over time, right? We're not just in one big cycle that's kind of rotating through, but rather like trying to kind of work on certain goals at a time and, and in that kind of continue to make progress forward. Um, so a goal we just wanted to remind you that we have is that 90% of Mountain View students are proficient or above in reading and mathematics by the end of grade three and then remain proficient or above beyond grade three. And um, Julie's going to speak to how this um, came to be, but we do want to say that this is ambitious. However, it's attainable and it does require every person in our system in order to make it happen. Okay, next slide. So you may be wondering, what is this 90%? There were scores of teachers across the district from all schools looking at literacy and math. And they called themselves the Equity Working Group. And their mission was to increase excellence, equity, and coherence around, our, around education for outcomes in our district. So they're looking at um, the research around uh, learning and teaching and what would improve um, equitable outcomes for our students. And the teachers um, and leaders as part of that group decided that the research was clear, that we were going to aim for what the research says is possible. And um, they set that goal, which would be achieved through some shifts in our the kinds of instruction that we're um, providing to students, guided by a knowledge building comprehensive curriculum, and inclusive of interventions and all the wonderful supports that we can offer our students. So the question we are now left with is how will we know we are at 90%? Okay, that's a question we keep asking ourselves and we hear from everybody else. Well, a couple of weeks ago when I was down in DC with Sherry at a conference, I was able to sit in on a presentation by Thomas Gusky, and it was about this topic. And he said, you know you're at 90% or whatever goal you have when your most trusted assessment or tool or piece of information tells you so, right? Seems pretty straightforward, um, but we're going to get into how what a trusted assessment is, is actually quite nuanced. So what we're gonna ask you to do is a little activity. I know we've never really done this before, so this is new for us. Um, anyone in the room can participate. Uh, what we're gonna ask you to do is right now, pretend you're donning your board member hat, okay? So you're here with a particular perspective um, we're going to ask you to take off that hat for a second or whatever hat you're wearing and don um, a parent hat. So think of yourself as a parent of your own children in a school system or if you have grandchildren or just sort of pretend. Um, and what we have some sheets of paper around and we'd like you to write down anywhere in front of you on a blank sheet or, or just even scribble with a note. As a parent or guardian, what is your number one most trusted source of information about your child's performance in reading and math. 
What is your number one most trusted source? And don't talk about it. Just write down what is your, as a parent, maybe dotting up in fiction hat. And can folks online participate? Absolutely. Yeah. Folks online or in the audience, you can participate. <laughs> Just write your answer on and hold it up to the camera. <laughs> Okay, breath of so when you finish, just turn and share that with your yeah. partner. Talk to someone next to you. Yeah, I'm sorry. My mom is calling. I just want to make sure she did that was a really fun conversation we heard everything from what i see my child doing we heard a lot about grades we heard a lot about homework and how hard it is to get your child to do the homework or not that was a fun one um report card report cards that's a big one Thank you for that conversation. Great. So the next slide, we're going to ask you to take off your parent hat for a minute and now put on a community member. <laughs> okay. So as a community member, the people you represent this board, what's your number one trusted, most trusted source of information about Mountain View students' outcomes in reading and math? So write your answer down. Take a moment to gather your thoughts with your community member and then turn to a thought partner and talk to them. So that the community is born. Actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> so thank you for engaging in that activity. That was great to hear your thoughts on that. And it helps us gather some data because this is actually a part of our data collection process. You didn't realize you're actually giving us excellent information to <laughs> plan with. So Ras can speak to this. So um and, and, and this really hits on something that, that Sam was just talking about, like most trusted really varies, right? And, and I think what you may have seen in this activity is that from one perspective you may have trusted one data source more and from a different perspective you may have sought of something else and this is the struggle that we face as well and trying to figure out what 90 percent what measure we use um, and so we have all these different measures they all serve a different pur different purposes they all have their own strengths and shortcomings and so we're trying to find a way to mix and match these together um, in a way that really represents 
how students are doing, acknowledging that tension that all of you, or many of you just pointed out in that there is some real difference in those perspectives. And if you think about change on this scale, which requires every person to be involved, you need to make sure that every person trusts the data and has the ability to celebrate when you actually reach proficiency. If you're not trusting the data used, you can't celebrate. So that's what we're hoping to do here. Next slide. So we are going through a process of um, triangulating data, which is essentially we're trying to capture the right sources of information to get a snapshot of what success looks like at 90%. So that's what that term means. And um, yeah, next slide. So this is where we are. We are in the process of gathering information from stakeholders. We have students, K to three, teachers, K to three, split out grades, four to 10, principals, district admin, parents, and community. We're trying to tease out what are those most trusted assessments of how our students are doing towards proficiency. And um, then we are hoping to come up with celebration points <laughs> using those assessments so we can say, hey, we are bronze as a district and actually celebrate that and then maybe have a silver benchmark, gold, and then aiming for platinum alone. Of course, we're still in that data collection process, um, but we just wanted to give you a snapshot of what we're working on as we're working towards continuous improvement and reaching that profession people. I think also like these phases of, um, as we're celebrating at different phases like that really contributes to how we evolve through those sort of cycles of improvement like we learn a little bit at each celebration it's not you know it's great to give ourselves a pat on the back and i think that's so important but also that that data in itself to be able to move forward with some of those also okay yeah no i'll go right here any questions No, thank you very much for the, uh, the the data reports that we do get uh, regularly, and also for explaining what they mean uh, for the board. So thank you. For all you do. Uh, may I ask a question? No, uh, I'm just asking a question. Yes, can I ask a question? Um, can you tell us a little bit about where we are now with these goals? Deirdre, I'm sorry, but we only take the questions during um, public comments. So at the end of the meeting, you'll have a chance to ask that question. Thank or you. Make a statement. Thank you. Um, okay, the next up is the mountain biking request. Uh, this fall, the mountain bike team came uh, to the board with a request to be granted uh, from club, to be moved from club status to varsity status. Uh, at the same time, the, there is a, a committee, the policy committee is working on the same kind of thinking, but separate and apart from that, um, because that policy isn't ready yet to be uh, approved by the board, uh, following BPA guidelines and regulations, um, we determined that indeed they did meet the, the, um, the measures for becoming a team. Uh, they have many people on their team, so they certainly have plenty of participation, and they have been operating for quite a few years. So, um, and when the board was, the finance was discussing the financing, they did include a, uh, an amount for the mountain biking request. So we're asking tonight to uh, ask any questions about this, although I'm not an expert on it, that the expert isn't here. Um, that we did um, suggest that we vote to uh, grant them varsity status starting in the next uh, school year. I'll make a motion to. Oh, go ahead. I thought maybe Matt Stout should make the motion. Oh, here. Okay. Yeah, uh, Matt Stout, yeah. would you make the right. motion? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll, sure, I'll make the, the motion to approve um, uh, changing the status of the mountain bike team from club to a varsity team. I'll second. Matt, would you like to make any comments? Um, just, I think I've made this comment in the board uh, meetings before. Just that um, it, it's a it's a tremendous opportunity that we offer the kids. It's it's not offered at every school, um, and they're they're very very serious athletes uh, competing at some of the top national levels. Um, you know the coach puts in his time and effort like every other coach. And so I think he deserves a stipend. Uh, but aside from just the, the budget, I mean, these kids deserve to be recognized like all other athletes at the school. 
uh, on the bulletin boards on this week in sports. Uh, and you see that happen in the in the Vermont standard, but you're not even seeing it happen in the halls of the school because there are some restrictions on how clubs versus teams are treated. So I do feel passionately about it and I hope that the board is in favor of it. Thank you. Any other comments from the board or questions? I would like to say that uh, that I concur with everything that Matt said, uh, not only at the high school level, but this also has uh, feeder groups for fifth and sixth grade riders as well. So I'm expected that we'll get more participation there also. And um, as a little bit of an adrenaline junkie, I had a hard time keeping up with fifth grade riders. So these kids are, excuse me, these riders are incredible, really incredible. How many kids participate in mountain biking currently? Do we have a sense? Right. You remember a very large number. Matt, do you know? Um, I, the numbers, I think, are around 35. Uh, so I know just off the top of my head, like girls varsity soccer, just my daughter just did that, was the largest team program in the school, and that was 44. So just to give you a sense, like this team is definitely um, at that level. All right, are we ready to take the vote? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much for your support of this newest uh, varsity sport. Let O and A to make sure you let folks there. Yeah. All right, um, the next appointment is to appoint a union arena and Potwin Trust Board member. We serve um, on that uh, board, and at our last meeting, uh, when the um, need was made known, Ray Rice uh, offered to fill that position. So, uh, if somebody would like to nominate Ray Rice for that, mm -hmm. so moved. Anna has moved it, and is there a second? Second. Do we need to discuss Ray Rice? <laughs> uh, no, I've reached out to him. So. <laughs> I've reached out to the uh, to the trust. They're not necessarily called trustees, but I've reached out to them, and I'm in the email chain, and uh, it's all moving forward as planned. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ray, for doing this. Um, uh, we 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 not. Yeah. Okay. All in favor of appointing Ray, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, Ray, very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, now we have um, the projected fiscal year 25 budget presentation from uh, Jim Penn and Zen Ford. Okay, Jim, am I taking it away? Sure. <laughs> Share my screen, yeah. Okay, um, a month ago, we were here, uh, I need to get this switched over. Um, we went through a presentation on the budget, and I'm going to rewind this. Um, I'm going to run through the same deck that we went through uh, in uh, December. I didn't update the slide, but I or the, uh, the cover slide. Um, but wanted to um, uh, present uh, the same topics with just a little bit more information, and kind of refresh on how uh, tax rates work. And by the end of the presentation, we'll provide the projected FY25 town tax rates. Um, just to not bury the lead, what we're seeing is that you know, the CLAs came in last week, and there are, we are uh, seeing um, massive, um, uh, in, I guess, um, appreciation of real estate values, and that's what the CLA is based on. Uh, we've seen it happen for the past couple of years, and it's continuing. It's real estate activity from um, 2021, 22, and 23, and um, these latest numbers are, are reflective of that. So um, sobering, but let's uh, let's uh, move into the presentation. Um, so again, I wanted to remind everybody about the implementation of Act 127, the portion of the budget this year. And I'll provide a little bit more detail on this that is subject uh, to increase due to spending of the school district is going up by 5%. And the reason for that is because we're capped at 5%. And the way that the, um, the yield has been set this year, and this is a number we can go through, um, it's uh, it's forcing just about every school district in the state to be at that 5%. And I'll, uh, I've got a graphic on that in a minute. Um, 
like I said, all towns except for Pomfret are going to see um, you know, pretty significant increases uh, to tax rates due to the CLAs. Pomfret, of course, did their reappraisal last year, so they're in a little bit different situation. And then um, we'll talk this evening about the opportunity we have with the Act 127 framework to uh, reduce our capital debt uh, based on what I'm going to refer to in a moment as a, a dead zone and um, the impact of that 5% cap. I'm going to skip through some of these slides, but just as a refresher, we arrive at tax rates by taking our entire total expenditure budget, uh, subtracting our local revenues. Those are things like grant funding, tuition dollars, and we come to education spending. Education spending is what we need to raise from the education fund. It's taxpayer dollars. Um, the, from here, and these are some of the edits that you might remember from a month ago, you take education spending. You used to divide it by your, uh, your equalized pupils. The new factor that's used in the funding formulas is called weighted long-term membership. Um, that equals your per pupil spend. And it used to be that we had a penalty phase or excess spending threshold. That's been uh, you know, uh, put on hold through FY29 for the transition period of Act 127. In its place is a cap of 10% in per pupil spending from one year to the next. So, so long as we do not exceed a 10% increase in our pupil, per pupil spending, our taxes will go up 5%. If, you, um, if they do go up by more than 10, then uh, you're subject to a tax rate review by the Agency of Education, uh, the secretary, three superintendents, three business managers, and they'll determine whether or not the uh, spending was within district's control, and whether it's supported by good cause. And if you fail that, then you don't get the benefit of the cap. You take, um, so you take that per pupil spend, divide it by the property yield. That's the factor that indicates kind of how much money is in the ed fund on the basis of a forecast. And that gives you your equalized tax rate. That's the um, tax rate that applies at the district level before the town. Um, and then that um, utilization study, that three-year CLA study I talked about, um, is the, the equal tax rate gets tax rate gets divided by the CLA, and that gives you your town tax rate. So the budget drivers we talked about last time, um, these have all kind of come into place uh, uh, based on the, um, the the audit results. We're not expecting a surplus or a deficit from our most recent audit. Um, this would have been of you know FY twenty three. It's a kind of a, a one year lag. Um, we have a new system for counting our ADM, right? The the um, LTW ADM. The number of pupils we have now is is a little bit uh, hard to follow. Uh, in that we're going from 918 to 1,500, and today we got an update. This number is now 520, <laughs> and those numbers are now locked. Um, so those were in flux um, over the last few weeks. Uh, the yield goes from 15,479 last year down to 9,452. That's the number that's forcing everybody into that 5%. One of the big things in impacting our budget is the cost of uh, health insurance. This is set at a statewide level. And we just get told how much health insurance costs. And it's a 16.4% increase this year. There's nothing that the district can do about it. Um, increases to staff pay. We've got some commitments that we need to make good on uh, based on existing contracts and obligations. The teacher contract will be renewed uh, this next year. That's TBD. Um, we've got some flexibility in our budget to handle where we may land with that, um, but we'll uh, have to see what that does. And then that, uh, like I said, the 5% cap on the equalized tax rate is due to the um, Act 127 fire implementation. Um, so what does that leave us with is the question of, you know, what's our, you know, tax capacity? That number is around $26 million. Uh, that's the, how much we can raise from, um, you know, the Ed Fund, take from the Ed Fund and, and still have a 5% increase to taxes. So we'll keep that number in mind. Can I ask a question yeah, on sure. that last slide? So that said we had 1,500 students? Yeah, but they're not students anymore. They're, they're weighted and essentially, and you might okay. we might remember um, these slides, these weightings. So this is our existing okay. weightings under you know, before right. Act 20, um, 127. This is the only things that kind of changed what you counted for a pupil. And these new weightings are additive, right? You add these weights or subtract in the case of the three-year-old pre <clears throat> student, um, that amount. So all these others are increased. And the reason that we're coming out so far ahead is because 
But during Act 46, we picked up Reading. We took on Barnard Elementary School. We have Plymouth. We have Bridgewater. We have places that are very sparse. And sparsity, as you can see, counts a lot. And you take that across all the students of our district, and it comes out to each one of our students now counting for about 1.6 in the count. Right, that's just a factor. It gets these are all formulas that the state uses to determine the distribution of education funding in the state. And yeah, well, if per pupil spend goes up, say eight or nine percent, mm -hmm. the taxes only go up five. Mm -hmm. Where's the other three or four percent come from? Um, that's a great question, and a lot of people are, are very excited about it right now. Uh, for those who have been around uh, Vermont a long time, I haven't been around as long as uh, for, for Act 60, for instance. This is another kind of reshuffling, right? Like, not to that magnitude, but there are... Um, actually, I'm going to show you in a, in a moment kind of some of the, the, uh, the exchanges we've had with the AOE on this, because... Our um, recently, uh, our, our representative for Woodstock, um, Charlie Kimball, um, he and I had a discussion after the last um, um, uh, board meeting, and he was concerned that you know, he thought that this 5% cap only applied to the losers, as it were, from, from Act 127, those districts who were going to be coming out behind. Uh, it's not so. And so, you know, I gave him a read of the, of the new law, and he took that to the AOE, Brad James, who crunches all the numbers, and Brad confirmed. Um, and there was some exchange about, you know, like, well, how can this be? Where's this money going to come from, right? If, if people are, you know, tapping into the tax and, you know, it remains to be seen, right? But we'll see. There's some things the state could do to kind of um, close off the number of districts that are, um, you know, uh, be, you know, able to kind of cash in on that. And uh, the, the biggest one would be to raise the yield, right? If, you, if you, the state were to invest, say, like, take a bunch of cannabis money, and put that in the ed fund, then mm -hmm. you eliminate districts' ability to hit the 5% cap, right? And we'll have to see. They, and that's what the um, tax commissioner was essentially calling for the legislature to do. Mm -hmm. But anyway. And um, can you come back to the pie chart that you skipped over that shows where the revenue comes from? Oh, in the ed fund? Sure. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good one to show. Yeah, sure. Um, this is just the, the, the state ed fund and, and what, what makes it up. Um, and we talked about these in the last board meeting, but a lot of people don't realize that homestead property taxes, that's the, your full time residents, only contribute about a quarter of the ed fund. That's the, uh, the bottom portion. The largest portion is from non homestead taxes, right? Your, your businesses, your second homeowners contribute much more to, and, and the ed fund pays you know, everything, right? It's, it's both your, um, you know, all your teacher salaries. If, if, uh, in a moment, we're already talking about the new building um, and the, the bond for that. It's the same source of money. And then sales and use tax contributes almost as much as the homestead property tax. And then the other, the state lottery, um, meals and rooms, vehicle purchase and use tax, some other sources. Yeah. Okay, let's, um, oh, this is interesting. So those are the drivers. Uh, what I wanted to, this is all stuff we've talked about before. Um, I want to, here's, I don't know if you, anyone, everyone can see this in the room, but this is just an email from Brad James confirming that um, he says that exact reading of the language supports as it states when applying the formula created under this act, it's not the cause of the tax rate increase, whether you're a you know, loser district, you know, in this, um, but the overall application of the funding formula to the budget that's the, the, term, the determinant. And so he says, I do want to make sure everyone knows that if you don't have a 5% cap tax rate in any of the five years, then the capping option is no longer available for the ensuing years. So for a district like ours, it's very important that we hit the cap this year, right? Because if we don't, then that's not available to us for the next four years. And we could see tax rate increases, you know, depending on what comes. Um, and that's something that we, um, you know, have, you know, kind of set the number at to, to achieve. Okay, so um, budget priorities is something you talk about every year. Kind of why are we spending roughly three and a half million more dollars this year than we did last year? And uh, these are some of the things that we've talked about in, in sessions with the board so far, you know, adding uh, positions that are of, of critical importance, adding uh, one of the pre-K classrooms back to West, that's an investment in enrollment, right? So that helps to, to get the health of our, our district and our budget. Um, the health insurance, we can't do anything about. Capital projects, that's really kind of discretionary. That's something that we'll, we'll see here. It, it, we'll need to decide whether that we want to, you know, uh, add that this year or not. I'm going to recommend that we do. 
Um, and then the wage and benefit increase. This is just for the obligations that we've already got. Um, you know, um, a lot of that, when we walked through the budget, you may remember Jim talking about how we switched a position and someone who was single, um, you know, had a, a, you know, a spouse or a family. And a lot of those um, benefit increases, you know, we've got to cover. So we had a lot of that activity this year. Um, that remind me, because I'm blanking, uh, when did pre-K go from being cost neutral to being a budget expense? When did that, we make that decision? Cost neutral? Well, remember when we first started doing pre-K that that was the decision was it was supposed to be cost, it wasn't, it was supposed to be. Well, I mean, in terms of, I don't know, Jim, maybe you could speak to that in terms of when we add the pre-K, is that going to you know, right. cost more money or is it going to drive more revenue through enrollment? And that was, a, I thought, when we were, we had, when we had first talked about doing it, that that was the plan was to keep a cost neutral by driving enrollment. I I wasn't here when you originally started with yeah. the pre-Ks. Uh, one of the things that has changed in next year, though, is the four-year-olds get a full count instead of a half count. Okay. So we'll generate more revenue with the four-year-olds. Um, okay. And the three-year-olds still are a half count or approximately a half count on the on the uh, the money from the state. So that's that will help offset this. Uh, keep in mind that we had five pre-Ks at West last year. We dropped the three this year mm -hmm. and could have filled the fourth one. And so this is really as we're right-sizing the program in that building. Okay. Right. And the other thing I should point out, Sam, is that this is going to be a lag because you count your ADM in the first week, right? So we only have three pre-Ks at West right now, okay. right? So we only get the revenue for the students right. this year, even though we have to you know, take on the cost okay. for this new pre-K. Okay. If, you know, in a year from now, it may be revenue neutral. I expect it probably will be. Okay. That's, I, I'm just, my I'm guess just is curious. That, I remember a lot of talk around that when we first started doing pre-K, and then I see it in a bunch of lines, so I just wanted to... Yeah, my, my guess is it's about revenue neutral because right now with the children that are in the private schools, we have to pass through all the state funds anyways. Okay. And so the difference is we keep them here and we teach them with our programs. So this next slide I, I put together just to show you um, what the impact of um, Act 127 is on our um, spending decisions this year. So this line that you know goes across the, the chart, you can see these are the different levels of spending, right? These are in millions of dollars. And last year we spent you know around you know $22 million and had a tax rate, the equalized tax rate of 15223, right? This year um, we very quickly, within about a million dollars of spending, and you saw all the things on the last slide that you know we need to spend money on to make good on our obligations to you know our community, to our teachers, just to pay for the health insurance. Um, within about a million dollars, we hit that five percent cap, right? If uh, the plan spend we've got is up here, but there's no difference to the tax rate in this entire band, right? This is the difference between that five percent and the ten percent. So we would have to cut two million dollars from our budget just to start um, saving money to the taxpayer. Right, which is you're talking about firing 20 people. That's really the only way you can you know, make those kinds of savings, cutting programs, cutting people. And then if you were to um, you know pay off again, I said in the uh, in the overview that oops, excuse me um, that this is um, you know an opportunity to save uh, to pay off about 750k in debt. Um, you may remember last year the Killington Roof project. The architecture fees, the upgrade to the heating system, we borrowed $5 million. Well, with this additional tax capacity, right, at the same tax rate, we can, um, you know, take that money and, and start kind of cleaning up our budget, right? And that's, you know, the, the recommendation to the board is that we do that, right? Because we, we can't save the taxpayer money, um, you know, this year um, without wildly impacting programs. You may as well take advantage of the structure that we've got. And if you next year because you're capped at 10 percent over next year it's like if you can capitalize on this for a couple of years you can actually do quite a bit of cleanup and still be under the yeah and you you may not believe it but i've done some math on that <laughs> quite hard to believe yeah right? yeah. yeah i'll be uh, happy to show it to you after you it. yeah um yeah and you can see that it's if you go one penny over that say 26 million dollar uh available spend that we saw on the budget <clears throat> drivers your tax rate flips, you know, jumps up by, you know, 20 cents. Um, so that's a line that um, Jim will be uh, tasked with absolutely not crossing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the budget drivers. 
Now, uh, here's the equalized uh, tax rate, and you can see this is a slide that I show every year. It's got a, a ton of data on it, but it's great to see trends. I think one of the most interesting things is um, looking at the, uh, this is not correct, that's not 5223. This is actually in that lower left on FY21, it was $1.80 uh, back in FY21, this number. Sorry about this, guys. This should be, oops. Um, this was, yeah, 181 back then. Um, so you can see that the tax rate came down over time. And what's going on? I got some, sorry, guys, I got some, some data issues there on FY23 on that bottom row, the equalized tax rate. But anyway, um, for the FY24 and 5, um, you can see the, uh, you know, you know, the, the various numbers, the three and a half million of additional spending. Um, one of the big drivers of that also is that we lost a whole bunch of local revenue, right? That that money that we um, that we you know kind of uh, count on the grant funding, that kind of thing, tuition dollars. Um, that's our education spending. You can see how that's changing. Um, again, that's really the, the difference in the expenditure budget plus the loss of the local revenues that drives that 4.4. And then um, you've got uh, your equalized pupil difference, the uh, per pupil spend. Um, uh, it's coming down. And I'm really sorry. I got some some data issues there. We were uh, cutting and pasting furiously. But anyway, um, let's get to the tax rates. So this was um, the current year tax rates. You can see this compares to FY23 um, and the increases that we had this last year. Like I said, this was kind of year two of the you know, three years of massive appreciation of real estate values. And here are next year's town tax rates. They are, um, like I said, ugly. These are the increases that we'll see at the town level, not as a result, as I said, of very much increase to school spending. We're capped at 5%. This is the CLA. This is the appreciation of home values that's doing this. Right. And as you can see, Comfort did their reappraisal. Um, there's you know, kind of getting off so a lightest because they kind of took their medicine with the reappraisal. So hopefully we'll see this cool. Um, you know, Killington, they they got kind of the worst of, of all of us um, in terms of the uh, um, you know the uh, where their CLA is down to five point two. That essentially doubles the tax liability from the grant list values. They have the dubious honor of having the lowest CLA in the state. Yeah, you know, just a little bit ahead of stuff. Right. But what this does is that every town and most towns in Vermont are required to <laughs> conduct a reappraisal. That's not going to save taxpayers money. I mean, when you do with the reappraisal, your home value gets updated on the grant list, and even though the the, um, the number is different, uh, excuse me, is, is uh, the sorry, the tax rate is lower. The amount owed is, is going to be able, um, a significant higher. Okay, questions on the budget and where it's um, ending up for us on tax rates. Okay. So let's go to the, we'll need to vote on the budget itself. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Are we, let's see, Jim, do you have the, the form of warning for the budget itself in here? In the door. Yeah, I think it's going to be. So five H. That's uh, there's two there's two articles. It's going to be article. Here we go. This now these numbers we want to revisit from what we got here. This is essentially the. Um, the number that we had, let's see, just for my hand in slide here. Uh, yeah, that's this number is what's in the warning. And if we want to do the 750 to come kind of close to that line without going over, then the number is. Apologies, like I said, we've been doing a lot of math around here lately. 30,429,153. That sound right to you, Jim? Yes. And the per pupil spend number would then be 17 million 43. So do I have a motion to approve 
the uh, FY25 um, budget warning at those numbers. I shall move. Scott? Is there a second? Second. Discussion. How so, much did the uh, per pupil cost go up mm -hmm. in that way? Mm -hmm. Per pupil cost and last year? Uh, it was going to be 10%, yeah. right? It's like right up to that line um, of that uh, 9.5. We want to give ourselves some buffers so we don't go over the line. Mm -hmm. But the it's interesting because it's calculated um, so differently because it, 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 what's a pupil yeah. is different. It's so different. Right? So it, like, even, yeah. it went from like twenty four thousand dollars to you know seventeen. Yeah, I was going to say Right. Yeah, that's why I was confused. So I was like, listen. <laughs> so what was the increase between last year's to this year's seven oh, seven of, million of the bu of the budget number yeah. about three and a half. Three and a half in spending. Um, so, very rudimentary terms. Appraisal value has gone up, right? The benefit of people want to move to a place like this, property values are going up, but we're not bringing in a lot of people to our districts, period, across the state. <clears throat> so, we still, we still have to keep up with what the appraisal is, but with less people. Mm -hmm. People. Well, some of those families. That have moved here do have kids. Yeah, very few. Probably not enough. Yeah, right? not enough. Yeah, very few. Oh, we do yeah. still continue to be at a, at a rate as a state where we're, we have more deaths than we have births. Yeah, I'd say certainly the um, number of students that we gained during the pandemic, yeah. pandemic um, it didn't offset the increases to real estate value. Yeah. Yeah. And those have kind of gone back down to pre pandemic levels. Right. So, that, like, Historically, right when they developed suburbs, you had families moving in. They, you know, that would justify, you know, increased costs for properties. But then you had more people paying into it, so it wasn't as big of a jump. Mm -hmm. Now we have higher property values, but we're not getting enough kids, young people, families to offset the costs. Mm -hmm. And that's my basic mm -hmm. level. Yeah, but one of the hopes is that when you go back to like these drivers of the again, hope is a terrible word to use when you're you know looking budget decisions, but um the you go back to these sources of the ed funds, you know, if you've got you know this massive influx in, in real estate um value, then you know you would expect to see you know that kind of um even out the hits to the tax rate, right? If everything is going up kind of evenly. But that remains to be seen. You know, we have massive inflation, and we'll talk about that on the school bond here in a moment. Matt Stout has an end up. I don't see it right now, but Bam. I want to go back to Matt. Um, I'll just say that on that CLA question, it seems like the towns that have property values that are growing the fastest um, would be then contributing more to the state funds. Um, is that is that true? I think that's the point I was just trying to make. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, on this question of could we possibly reduce our budget to under 5%, I think you said really well that there's no viable path to do that without massive layoffs and reducing programs. Yeah, um, let me let, let me hit that, man. Sorry, if you have a question, let me cut you off. Go ahead. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so let me if you go back to this slide uh, here, right? This this dead bang slide that I presented. One thing the state could do, like I said, if they if they poured like a bunch of of you know like cannabis money into the end fund, you could see that yellow system that that yellow area would go up, right? Because um, the the five percent threshold um, would be at a higher point of spending, right? So at that point. I mean, it's unfortunate that that's going to happen in the spring that the legislature is going to meet and make some decisions about, you know, how to um, adjust the yield. They could very much set the yield to the point where we can't hit 5%. And that would be a smart thing to, for the state to do if they think that a lot of districts are going to take advantage of this kind of free money that Bob was you know, looking at, right? But we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see if that if that happens. I don't know where they'd get the money. From the tax commissioner's letter, they've kind of indicated that all the pandemic money is drying up and you know, kind of looking to the legislature to find some money. But sorry, I cut you off. 
Yeah, I'll just be be quick. So the the motion on the floor is to take it to the um, that third highest point there, that just under the ten percent. Is that I didn't correct? Hear that. Okay. Yeah. I, I I support the motion. It's I mean it's the same effect on our taxpayers if it were five percent. And I'm done with comment. Thank you. Anna, uh, I'm going to direct this both to Ben and Jim. How comfortable do you feel that we can reach that point next year without surpassing the cap? I mean, are we giving y'all enough buffer zone so that we're protecting ourselves from penalties? Yeah, this is about half a percent of buffer, and it gives us, and today the um, student numbers were locked. Um, Brad James was actually in like the last week of his uh, career at the um, um, Agency of Education, his last, last active office to answer that email. But the, his replacement, what's what's her name, Nicole Lee? Nicole Lee. She sent out the updates and she said, these numbers are now locked. We have our numbers of our, our last year's pure pupil, per pupil spend. We have this year's um, ADM number. And at that point, it's just a math equation. I think the question is, like last year, we saw um, a reduction in the local revenue and something like that. If you had to um, reach into taxpayer funds to make up for a shortfall and say grant funding, and that could take you over. I, but, I think I see our local revenue as being fairly safe for the next few years. Okay. Um, where we can gain is in two areas, I think. One is as Killington starts their development, but also every additional tuition student we bring to the high school is $20,000 of revenue. So five students is $100,000. Right. And I think that that's the push that we need to keep doing. And I know that the high school staff is doing that, but that's the push that we need to keep doing. And that's interesting. The more, if you look towards those future years, <clears throat> the increase in spending is measured on your per pupil spend. So the more pupils you have, the more kind of free money there would be if you're in that zone. I just so. want to make sure that with this this <clears throat> amount, when we move forward with a vote, that that it's it leaves us some space between that number and that that five percent cap that we're not going beyond that. I, I believe it does. I think the intent is to take this extra money and do a double payment on the debt. Um, we don't have to do that next year if we don't if we can't. But this is because we're not locked into it, but it gives us some flexibility next year as we develop things. Okay. And I guess the other thing is, I would say is um, you certainly don't want to get called <clears throat> in the principal's office with this new tax rate review. But if we had a situation where we went over by you know, a very slight amount and we were paying off debt, that's an easy you know, case to make to the AOE to say we should get the cap. Right. Not, not we're not like out there, you know, know we're spending irresponsibly, we're paying off debt. But we just need to find at least five mountain bike enthusiasts. Um you were talking about the local revenues that dropped so much last year, but you said that they would probably stabilize the next few years. What was it that was making them drop so much last year? Was it just grants or some some of it was grants, some of it is the state has forced us to separate food service from the general fund. And so some of the food service revenues we no longer recognize in this portion of the budget. And so that, that's a one time you cut it out and everything else remains fairly stable. Um, there's one other revenue line that's gone up three years in a row. And I have mixed emotions about it. It's um, our special ed grant money. And if we're getting more money, that's because we're spending more money. So it's one of those, you don't really want it to go up. You want it to be stable, but um, yeah. And just for the board's edification, so you're not, you know, it's not just Jim and I in a fever dream about this stuff. This is in the media. This is an article from Stowe um, over the, the um, holidays where they're, uh, you can you know, Google this, of course, but um, what they're talking about with the headline, Stowe schools to budget extra without tax rate increases. And their number was the same one we looked at last time, was around uh, 1.5 million. We adjusted that after some of those local revenue um, uh, things came through. But you can see, um, you know, they're saying the, the same thing, right? The math also works in reverse, supporting your superintendent, Ray Herity. If district officials decided we're not going to spend a dime more we spent last year, tax rate would be the same. Even the district would have to make significant cuts, and it'd be devastating, right? So, this is talking about this kind of all over the state. 
Okay. Any other questions from the board? All right, uh, we have a motion to approve and uh, second. So all those in favor of voting uh, approval of this budget would please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Opposed. Okay. The budget has passed. This level. Hey, Rhea, what do we? Um... Yeah, I we have to take a roll call vote now. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, if you're online, would you please start by saying aye or no? Uh, Matt? Aye. Bryce? Aye. I don't think there's any other board members online. Oh, uh, Ray? <laughs> you're on mute. I don't think you vote. I don't think, that's I don't vote think I vote for this. I don't vote for this. Okay. You still matter. <laughs> All right, we'll just go around the table. Uh, ben? Aye. Sam? Aye. 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 Nay. Nay. Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Helping us here. Just happened. Okay. Um, All right. So the next. Um, uh, up is the adopt the resolution of necessity for capital construction project. Uh, Jim, do you want to speak to this one? This I think is probably a result of your conversation with Bob Fletcher. Sure. Um, in in Vermont, when you do a capital project, you have to state for the record why you need to do the capital project, and so this is. A legal document drafted by our attorney that tells us um, that you want to do the project. A um, couple of the things that are important to note. Um, it's not in this declaration, never mind, it's in another part which is the lack of state funding uh, for this, but that's... You can see that in a second, be it further yeah. resolved. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, this is your process of acknowledging that you want to do this project. And this is not the bond itself, is that correct? That's correct. And this is just a required step to be able to, um, to have a bond? Sure. Okay. Is it something we need to vote on? Yes. A motion to uh, move this declaration forward. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the board members? So, Bob, according to this, the bond amount is now going to be 99. That's correct. And we have a we're limiting the cost to taxpayers to 60 percent increase. That's our policy. But the state is also adding a 20 percent increase to property taxes before the CLA. This is for the new CLA. 25? Yeah. So you're talking about like the numbers we just looked at? No, that's separate. The state's also talking about doing a 20 percent property tax hike statewide. <laughs> so now we're talking, I'm just trying to make sure that we had this all figured out to our vote voters. Sure. And to, that we're talking like a significant increase over the next three years. I think you may be referring to the tax commission of December one letter where we talked about an 18 and a half percent increase statewide. Yeah, driven by 12 and a half percent increases in school yeah. budgets. That's the CLA. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you, you take the five percent of you know the school budgets and then you add what the CLA is doing on average statewide, people are looking at 18 and a half. It's not an additional 18 and a half to the numbers we just looked at. But it, it's an 18 and a half percent increase, and then you're doing another 16 on top. Across the state, most of our districts are going to see worse than that in 25. Yeah. But the thing to bear in mind is that the repayment for the school project will not come online until FY28. <clears throat> so we're not talking about FY25 or six yeah. or seven. Right. This is several years down the road. But yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're also been talking about this being driving enrollment, but over the next four years, 
based off just our class numbers, as I stand right now, we're talking about 75 down between this graduate, next four graduating classes before that would start to new classes coming in based on our number of students back here. Well, you're expecting that will the classes that will replace graduating classes yeah. will be smaller than the ones that- Well, that's what we see in our numbers right here. Yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to follow. Yeah. yeah. So we're just, we're talking about driving enrollment for this new school and the price, and we're, we're not seeing that as a, and it's going to happen as a trend. I mean, we're talking 56, 50, 61, like those are class sizes. Yeah. We're getting rid of 83 and 75 and 80 and 85. Right, but we're not gonna see enrollment from the new bills until it's happening, right? So those are the numbers. We're not gonna, what, what kind of enrollment do you think you're gonna see from the new bill? I don't think we're gonna see anything increase. We're gonna see what we see. Uh, you can, or I can. <laughs> Please, please keep in mind that you're missing an important part of that enrollment, and that is the tuition students that we start getting in the seventh grade. So we have seventh and eighth through twelve, and we and so that gap that you're talking about is mostly filled from out of town students, not 100 percent, but mostly filled by out of town students. Bob, yeah, I don't think voting to to borrow this money for the construction project has anything to do with the number of students we expect to have over the next few years. We're one boiler blowing up or one roof falling in away from having no school. Every one of those kids is going to have to go somewhere else if something like that happens. So not building a new school is not an option anymore. Thank you. Uh Sam, and one of the points that was just made is that, you know, the only way that we can look, we can look at potentially lowering any costs is by upping enrollment, and we are never going to up enrollment with the building that we have now. So, um, you know, I've, I've been on the board for eight years now, and I actually remember when I first started on this board, as you know, a uh, single mom who was on a budget, you know, I was thinking to myself, gosh, this new school board built, is this really worth it? Can I afford this? Can I, can I do this? And sitting on this board for years, listening to the conversations, we can't afford not to. That's, we really can't. Um, the, the building that it, you know, my son's going to this high school now, like it's, bad <laughs> it's really bad and we're lucky we have amazing ed educators that we do have um because they, they would not be it, it's amazing what they're doing in the building that they have it is absolutely incredible but they need a better building our students need a better building and it's gonna even though we're talking about this initial cost now it would cost the district so much more money over time to try and keep this building. Like that, that's the thing that I think people think they like, oh, just fix the building. If you look, we've had having this conversation, we have many slides that we've gone over. But if you try, if we try to keep fixing this building, which we have these buildings, which we have been doing for a long time now, we're gonna spend so much more money than getting a newer or better one mm -hmm. for our district. I have a little show and tell, Sam. We were perfectly in. Bring a pipe to a board meeting. I brought a pipe to a board meeting. <laughs> um, we replaced, we repaired two uh, leaks <laughs> in the <laughs> middle school <laughs> hydronic hot water system yeah. over at Christmas break. One we had a kiddie pool under. One of them we cut the pipe, the other section broke off and fell in our hands. But this is a pipe that we cut out of the middle school, which is not our problem section. And if you look at it, we're getting about 20% flow through the pipe. So we're ruining pumps that go across. We're, yeah, 
The you, reason we can't get hot water down to the far end is we can't get enough water through the pipe to actually get there. Geology has run some decalcification uh, solution through. Uh, if, we de if we decalcify it, which we It'll could do, <laughs> then we'll have a heavy boiling because of the yeah. plugging all the holes. Yeah, it's literally what's keeping them together. I think I have Bryce was up first. Bryce, that's, that's right, I think. Yeah, I'll just I'll just echo a little bit of what what Sam just said, but because I, I totally agree with everything you just said, Sam. But I, you know, I I also want to make sure that we're clear. You know, the way I've thought of this for a really long time, maybe maybe not initially. I started on the board around the same time as Sam, but over time we've learned, right? Like this number, it isn't going to be what drives the the tax rate. I mean, it it does, but indirectly, things like the bond rate that we're going to get have uh, just as much, if not more so, influence over this number being 99 million or if it was $80 million. Um, you know, the th things like that matter a lot. You know, we were talking about this years ago when the when it was in the 2% range, 2.5% range, and now, now it's higher, you know, and that actually has huge implications to taxes more so than the actual amount going up. So I would just encourage people to not worry so much about this dollar amount. It comes down to all the other the other factors. I personally don't care whether it's $140 million or if it's $60 million, if the tax rate goes up the exact same percentage. You know, so it's it's a numbers game and we have strong people that have been working on this. And I think they're trying their best to to be clear about those implications. And we that that should be the focus is on that increased percentage if that's what you're worried about, um, not so much on a total dollar amount. So this is just a point of order. This is just the uh, you know, the recognition of the need. Right. Um, I have some more materials on costing and that sort of stuff. For, uh, I was kind of saving for the actual um, right. budget for yeah. I just wanted to, um, I guess I have a question. If plan B would be to fix this tool, which, and, and you can't, it breaks. Is plan C to, to be in trailers? And what would that cost? Like if we just had to like yeah, relocate all kids in well, I know that it's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for each trailer, and so right. how many would? I mean, other communities do that, but it's not a, not a great option. Each, each trailer is two clients. Right. Um, yeah. I, I was, yeah, I'm just gonna make a motion. Wait, we kind of say okay. the, this is like call the question. Been raised. This is kind of not conversation. Call the yes. Are you calling the question? Yes, I'm calling. It. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, the question has been called. So um, we need to take a vote. Um, can you put the people back there? Oh, sure. Um, just what the what that is, right? We have, we already have a, a motion to second them. We do. Okay. All those in favor of the um, the resolution of necessity for capital construction project, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. We have to do a roll call, Bryce. Aye. Matt? Aye. Uh, I don't know if Ray votes or not. No, he does not. Ben? Aye. Sam? Aye. 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 Nay. Aye. 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 Okay. The resolution has passed. And now we're into the adopting form of warning for capital construction bond issues. Yeah, a little discussion on this one. Um, a little bit of presentation. Um, so this next item is the is the warning itself. This would go um, as an article uh, in front of most towns in our district town meeting. This is the school side of business. I wanted to call out some unfortunate language that we're um, going to have to kind of address. In this, you see that bold language um, is required by state law, uh, current state law, despite the fact that the school construction aid program is uh, um, suspended since 2007. Um, if you have to say that state funds may not be available at the time the project is otherwise eligible to receive state school construction aid, the district is responsible for all costs incurred in connection with any borrowing by the district for the project. In anticipation of the state school construction aid to kind of address the prejudice that that's going to um you know have on a, a voter who may or may not be informed um we have kind of repeated this required language with some preparatory language to explain that there really isn't a vermont school construction aid program right now and while we recognize that um yeah you know the district is responsible 
uh, to meet our responsibility, this is the, the last uh, sentence, while limiting impacts to district taxpayers, the district intends to use other state funding, such as available tax capacity resulting from the implementation of the new pupil limits under Act 127, the amounts raised through private fundraising. We have three and a half million so far, some time, obviously, before FY28 for those um, debts would come due. So you're saying that middle paragraph that's in bold has to be there? Yes. And then we're going to repeat a bit of it in the third paragraph? Yep. Okay. Uh, we don't want to uh, have someone say you were monkeying with it, right? So we want to have it kind of stand on its own and then, you know. Can it be not in language. bold, though? It has to be in bold. It, can so we they, put the whole thing in bold, then? What's that? <laughs> 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 oh, Let me go back to the uh, materials that we were looking at the last time, because I've got some new information, uh, new developments. We were talking about... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, the new building. Yeah, these, these, we we lost our we lost our our, our um, what do we call those barns on the back of the buildings. But anyway, um, the what, the question is is on everybody's minds, and that we're going to be facing at our road shows as we go to um, each town over the next two months and other events. Right, a couple more building tours. Is this is is this uh, project financially feasible, and is the price reasonable? We're, uh, we're still confident that we can meet the, um, you know, the 16% um, commitment that we made to our taxpayers. But it's interesting, the State Board of Education, this is the board that runs the Agency of Education. It's about a nine or so member board. They actually updated the square foot pricing over the Christmas holiday. On December 20th, they adopted new square foot. And this is, if you, uh, you can look at uh, column B here. And then and it's for high schools at six hundred and twenty dollars per square foot plus twelve fifty for demo plus twelve fifty per square foot for uh, for site work that gets you to six forty five for high schools and uh, six twenty for middle school. Our project um, with all uh, all in is at six twenty seven. So we are squarely within the new state guidelines for um, for uh, construction aid should that program come back. Um, also, and I don't know if you guys can see this, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but um, as part of making that recommend, uh, of making that recommendation to the board, the Interim Secretary of Education um, gathered a number of inputs. One of them was from Truex Collins. This is an architecture firm out of Burlington that does um, Vermont uh, school projects. And they grabbed five projects um, over the last couple of years. And the notes here, I'll read them because it's, um, it's difficult to see. But they said, um, you know, cost opinions presented here include estimated cost of construction and estimated professional fees, but do not include FF and E. FF and E is um, fixtures, furnishings, and equipment. Our number of 627 does. The cost opinion uh, opinions are, are presented in this column without accounting for cost escalate. Oh, that's that one. Okay. Um, let's see. Numerous sources indicate uh, real inflation for commercial construction between. 15 and 19 percent between December of 21 and early 2023. We certainly were victims of that. Um, they assumed a 10 percent uh, annual inflation. You can see there in that kind of center column, the broad one. Um, despite the fact that you know real world escalation is between 15 and 19. And um, let's see. Yeah. So they say for illustration purposes, we're using a global annual inflation rate of 10 percent so that we can compare theoretical cost as of today. So anyway, you can see these um, school per uh, per foot prices are coming in at the second um, you know to last column there between six hundred and thirty three dollars a square foot and seven hundred twenty six dollars a square foot. Every one of these projects is more expensive than our project on a square foot basis. So just some some context for what um, you know at a state level uh, everyone's looking at from a pricing standpoint. And those are estimates, and our prices are estimates. So it's apples to apples on this. Uh, that's correct. I mean, like you can see uh, the the status. Let's see, like the Milton Elementary Schools. Those are proposed. I think those are going to bond. Those bottom two are two options. One's like a renovation. The other one's a new build, right? So they've got different pricing. That project hasn't happened yet. I think the other ones. Some of them have already happened. Like the Danville Schools was December of twenty one. Central Vermont Career Center it was May of twenty one. And they were adding that escalation to those you know prices from from those days. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben, for getting the escalation. Sure, I think you know as we're. I know everyone's going to get a lot of questions from. Um, no, it's really helpful. Give you some perspective on you know, where where this project stacks up. As far as the last the previous chart, the fact that the state 
just made these changes, is that any indication that they might bring back this construction? There's a lot of talk about it, right? Um, I mean, I don't know. We'll see where the um, the excess tax capacity over the next five years goes. There's um, uh, there's a lot of money in that in that formula. That just there's also a lot of volatility in terms of what could happen. They can bring that ten percent down. We don't know what's going to happen, but that can be like a backdoor to state aid. At least that's what I got excited about over the holidays. I got excited about cookies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Uh, I don't I don't know. If we have even have a motion. Why we need a motion for the um, the form of warning for capital construction bond issue. Okay, is there a motion to um <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? I've lost a verb here. I got the form of warning. <laughs> is there a motion to move forward this uh form of warning? I shall move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Adam. Uh Bob, uh are there any further questions, comments from the board? Okay, it appears that we are ready to vote. All in favor of um, approving the form of warning for capital construction bond issue, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Unanimous vote. Thank you. We need to go roll call on this one. No. no. Maybe you can have a nay. Oh, I see. Okay, so I see we have something called the adopt the declaration of official intent. And uh, what, uh, Jim, do you want to explain uh, why we need to do this for now? I don't know that I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because the lawyer said so. Okay. Um, yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> I think we just need a motion. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Sam and Sam, thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? All right. Um, all those in favor of adopting the Declaration of Official Intent, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Well, we have one more. We have to adopt the warning for the public informational hearing. Yeah. This is the budget session, the info session that we do every year in the library. Okay. Good. Is there a motion to adopt the warning? So moved. And, okay. And Sam. Okay. Uh, any questions or discussion on the warning? Okay. All those in favor of adopting the warning for public informational meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that will be on Thursday the 29th. And Ray, to keep me honest here, but this next one is the morning of the district annual meeting, which appears to be March 5th, 2024, which would be um, happening at town meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. Via yeah, Australian ballot. Right. So this essentially gets us out of gathering in the library and conducting the business of the school district separate from town. Hall. We just put this on the ballot um, and voters come in, get their school district ballot and their town business ballot and hand it all there. That's officially our annual meeting at that point. Okay, is there a motion to adopt the warning for the district annual meeting? So moved. Anna, Bob? She's not, she's not second. Bob is second. Any questions on this? All those in favor of adopting the warning for the district annual meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, then, for, thank you doing all of that. I think you should eat a cookie or something. Yeah, I'm gonna eat a cookie. Or a brownie. Yeah, can we pass them around? This is also, Rita, did you make the brownie? I did. Uh, 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 oh, I did? I'll take it one of the Yeah, I'm gonna say brownie. I'm taking a brownie. Wait, do I want a corner? The audience is also welcome. You were down in chocolate. We see thank you. All right, so we are at- Hey, Ben, just so you know, your screen is still being shared with the public. With the, okay. yeah. All right, you're back. Okay, we need to approve the minutes from uh, the December 4th meeting as well as the December 18th meeting. I would entertain a motion to approve both at the same time. Second. 
All right. Any corrections or additions to those minutes? Thank you. Okay. All in favor of approving written minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. At this time, we have um, a lot of time for public comment. Uh, so, is there are members of the public that would like to speak? Are we skipping the committee? Oh, did I miss something? Yeah. Oh, oh, did. Did. oh boy. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. No, we are not quite ready for public comment. I don't see it in my. It's number six before that. Oh, all right. We've jumped ahead. Sorry about that. Okay, committee uh, updates. Finance committee. I think you just gave us some major <laughs> information. Yeah, we've been busy. So, we've been more we should not. <laughs> All right, we'll move right into the policy committee. Yep. So we have four policies that we're going to do as a group. These we're still in the process of updating our policies for the to comply with the SBA. So I have these four policies that are up for adoption, and they're basically formatting changes. We looked at them last uh, time. So I need a motion to adopt them. I'm sorry. Discussion. Yeah. <laughs> discussion. 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 State mandated policies. <laughs> Can we adopt them all at once or do we have to yeah. do them? Yeah. Great. Somebody would like to make a motion to adopt all at once? Somebody did. Yeah. 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 Okay. All at once. All right. We seconded it. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further discussion? Nope. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, Hi. Any opposed? Hi. All right, thank you. Policy committee, you seem to have <laughs> much more. All right, thank you. Honestly, we've got it's been a massive machine. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. All right, buildings and grounds. Matt. Um. Yeah, we did meet. It was an abbreviated meeting. It was the night of the special meeting, and we only had one agenda item, and that was to review and open the bids for the HVAC system at Kill Killington Elementary School. Um, the only one bidder made a proposal, and it was um, over three hundred thousand dollars over what we have in the budget to pay for that project. And so we voted as a committee to to uh, to reject the bid and go out to to rebid in, in the future. Uh, yeah. when we could put together more money for the project. That was the only item we had at the last meeting. I have a question. Okay, Anna has a question. And Matt, what's the current status of the HVAC and its need for replacement? So I I know if Joe is there, he's better in a better position to answer that. I can't tell if he's in the room. He's not. I can help out though, Matt. Uh, okay. He the HVAC in Killington West and Reading is all five to 15 years beyond its expected useful life. And so not only is it failing, it's at a level that's about 50% of what we expect at current standards. And so we have engineering for Reading. Reading's out to bid right now. We've done the Killington bid. We're engineering the West project. Um, we have some funding um, through efficiency for a lot of these projects, but it hasn't been enough. And so we're working on trying to figure out how to do the rest. Uh, these are projects that we're going to have to do sooner or later. It's, it's uh, yeah, what we do. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, anything further for building the grounds? All right, thank you. Um, negotiations, hiring, and retention committee. Bryce, do you want to give an update? Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, is, has been alluded to, uh, negotiations are ongoing. Obviously, not much we can say besides that. There's a placeholder in the budget. Doesn't mean it's going to fall in the number at all. It's a placeholder. Uh, just as for those of you that maybe are new to the board or unaware, uh, this is not uncommon, you know, in the, the eight years I've been doing this uh, before at Barnard Academy and, and probably Carrie could speak to it 
uh, better than I, because she was on the other side of the, the table um, before that. Um, this is just very commonplace, you know, negotiations usually wrap up after the budget time period. And, and to be honest, a lot of years, it's the, the fall when school starts and we have to kind of um, pay, you know, pay back pay. So just want to really realize where, you know, I think we're still in good shape to have it be earlier than some cycles, uh, but we're just not there yet in, in time for the budget period, which is, which is kind of the norm, but that's, that's it. All right. Thank you. Um, any working groups have a report? Yeah, just on a new bill, now that we are going to have a uh, new school on the ballot in March, uh, we'll be a series of information meetings in every town in the district over the next couple of months. I want to thank board members for helping to organize that to select boards and other groups in your communities. And more to follow. Um, Marlena is on line. Marlena, sorry to put you on the spot. Was there anything um, you wanted to say with regard to the upcoming uh, road shows? Yeah. I can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. Hello there. Um, no, I just want to, I just want to thank everyone, um, board members for your help with planning the mm -hmm. roadshow tours, um, and getting the word out overall, um, sending us questions, uh, to Ben or myself. Um, and I don't necessarily have anything to add other than that, but, um, I will be releasing, a new toolkit um, to promote the tours. And I could use um, all the help um, getting that out on social media channels, um, you know, you know, with your own personal, you know, content, you know, network and all that. So um, I'll be in touch uh, with the board with that toolkit, uh, should have it in a day or so. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Okay. Um, now then, I think we are ready for public comment. So we welcome you to, to identify yourself and um, speak briefly um, in, in case there's a lot of people who want to make it. If not, we have a little more time. Do we, are we still sticking to a two minute? We can try to stick to that, yes. Yes, Ms. Sachs. Um, Couple of, I have a comment and I have a question. The comment, unless I misunderstood, one of the board members said that the bond was $99 million, which we know it is. And with the rating we'll get, it could be 80 something. And I just wanted to clear that up. The rating has nothing to do with the size of the bond. It has only impact on the interest rate on the bond. And I heard that comment. So unless I misunderstood what he said, um, the bond doesn't change based on the rating. The amount of interest paid over the length of the bond will change. My question, uh, the question that I have is, will the actual school budget and the bond be two different votes at town meeting or if you adopt the budget, it includes the bond. No, it's two separate articles. On the... Okay, so there'll be two votes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom DiGiacomo, please. I hope that this, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, this is a question for Ben. Uh, a few meetings ago, when the attempt to reduce the bond from about 120 million down to the 99 million, um, he had mentioned uh, artificial turf and making a, removing a classroom, and he also mentioned something about furniture. Uh, my my question is, um, what what is included in the bond in terms of equipment versus um, a capital expenditure in the budget? And um, could you list those things? I mean, there, there's uh, obviously there's there are pieces of equipment in a in a science lab, but if if the furniture was part of that, then is there any other part of the bond? that's included in the 99 million that is actually furnishings or something beyond capital 
equipment, like maybe, for example, a large screen in the auditorium. Um, has that been broken down and figured out? Yeah, and we don't typically answer questions during public comment, but I'm happy to show you, and I can send you this um, deck um, after the presentation time, or after the board meeting, if you'd like. But here's the breakdown of costs, and it's essentially 90 million for the construction, and then a list of what we consider soft costs. I don't know if you can see your screen, but yes. you can see that FF uh, furniture's uh, Fixed, uh, fixtures, furnishings, and equipment, what we think of as FFB is at 1.765 million, and that's part of the 99 million uh, that will go to bond. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. Can you um, use that so we can see this? Oh, up? sorry. Oh, man, it's, it's not share. That's not look like there are any other. Might want to ask Tom to mute though, because he's not muted. Right. Well, I can you just go to, sorry, the Zoom. It's not wanting to go away. Sorry, guys. Presentation. Okay, well, if there are no other public comments, then um, we um, do have a probably brief executive yeah. session tonight for the board members, preceded by a photo. That we're going to take down in Sherry's office for the newspaper printing that goes out to a uh, well budget and heavy. So, thank you all for attending tonight.